it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And next order of business is the roll call. Supervisor Schobert, you are here remotely, correct? Yes, that's correct. Supervisor Hillblink, you are here remotely, correct? Correct. Supervisor Bosman, you are here remotely, correct? Here. Thank correct. <laughs> Supervisor Netting. Twenty-four supervisors present. Okay, thank you. And one dog. This is a consideration of a memorial resolution. Resolution number six. Resolution number six, honoring the life of former county board supervisor Alan S. Rader. Whereas Hi. former county board supervisor Alan S. Rader passed away on April seventh, twenty twenty-one. And whereas Mr. Rader served as County Board Supervisor over a span of 30 years from 1970 to 2000, having served on the then Agriculture Committee, which he chaired from 1971 to 1980, and again from 1982 to 1984, on the then Resources Committee from 1970 to 1978, and again from 1982 to 1988, on the then Welfare Committee from 1978 to 1982, on the Property Committee from 18, 1986 to 1988, on the then Highway Committee from 1988 to 2000, which he chaired from 1996 to 2000, and on the then Human Services Committee from 1994 to 2000. And whereas Mr. Rader also served his community on the Greenbush Fire Department for 52 years as fire chief and first assistant chief as Greenbush town clerk and as a member of the Farm Bureau, the Elkhart Lake Glambula School Board on the United Church of Christ, as well as many other clubs and organizations and as the builder and owner of the Stagecoach Drive-In Restaurant in Greenbush for seven years. And whereas Mr. Rader, was a polio survivor in his teenage years, never letting his disability slow him down. And whereas Mr. Rader will be remembered as a conservative man who treated people courteously, didn't like wasting county tax dollars, was concerned about providing proper roads for county residents, and was a proponent of Rocky Knoll and the Marsh. Now therefore be it resolved that by passage of this resolution, the county board herewith makes public its recognition of Mr. Rader's dedicated service to the citizens of the county and expresses its heartfelt sympathy to his family and friends and especially his wife Janet and children Deborah, Russell, and Perry. Be it further resolved that the clerk be directed to forward a copy of this resolution to Janet Rader, Deborah Sippel, Russell Rader, and Perry Rader respectfully submitted this 18th day of May, 2021. Pursuant to County Board Rule 2.13, this resolution will be on the floor for immediate action. And please join me in a standing vote. Thank you. Um, would Perry Rader and Debbie Sipple please come up to receive the resolution?
Resolution number seven. Regarding honoring the life of former County Board Supervisor Stephen H. Bauer, whereas former County Board Supervisor Stephen H. Bauer passed away on April 12, 2021, and whereas Mr. Bauer served as County Board Supervisor from 2014 to 2020, having served on the Law Committee from 2014 to 2016, Planning Resources, Agriculture and Extension Committee from 2016 to 2018, and the Property Committee from 2016 to 2020, which he chaired from 2018 to 2020. And whereas Mr. Bauer also served as community as chairman of the town of Sheboygan Falls for 14 years and as the owner of the SNR Bar and Restaurant for 37 years. And whereas Mr. Bauer will be remembered as being a personable gentleman who was extremely organized, loved politics, enjoyed working for the local people, especially those in the town of Sheboygan Falls, and who respected other people's ideas and opinions listening with an open ear, heart, and mind, and fighting for what was right. And now, therefore, be it resolved that by passage of this resolution, the County Board herewith makes public its recognition of Mr. Bauer's dedicated service to the citizens of the county and expresses its heartfelt sympathy to his family and friends, and especially his wife, Rosie. Be it further resolved that the clerk be directed to photocopy this resolution to Rosie Bauer, Respectfully submitted this 18th day of May, 2021. Pursuant to County Board Rule 2.13, this resolution will be on the floor for immediate action. And please join me in a standing vote. Okay, thank you. Um, would Rosie Bauer please come up to receive the resolution? Next is the approval of the April 20th, 2021 journal. S Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, move for approval of the journal of April 20th. Thank you. Supervisor Brower. I second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Brower. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, please vote. Uh, Supervisor Schobert, vote yay or nay? Yay, yes. Supervisor Hilbelink, yay or nay? Yay. And Supervisor Bosman, yay or nay? Yay. Thank you. Prove unanimously. Okay, next is consideration of reappointment by county administrator to Board of Adjustments, Pete Sherman of Plymouth. S Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd move for approval of Pete Sherman. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Abler. I'll support that motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Obler. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing no discussion, please vote. Supervisor Schobert, yay or nay? Yay. Supervisor Hillblank, yay or nay? Yay. And Supervisor Bosman, yay or nay? Yay. Thank you. That's uh, approved unanimously. Okay, next is a presentation. Uh, we have Matthew Stripmatter, Health and Human Services Director, giving a presentation on child welfare. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. It is my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, and I do mean pleasure. This is the third time in three years that I've been here uh, to speak to you about our child welfare system. 
And for the first two times, we were using the words crisis. We were using that because the state of Wisconsin was in serious straits, and especially here in Sheboygan County. And uh, tonight, although I'm not going to suggest we don't still have challenges, we used the word update because we have some very promising, very optimistic uh, news to be able to share in terms of results that we're getting from some significant work that's been done by staff in the last couple of years. So the presentation tonight, oh, I should back up. Basically, I'll try to, just in case you don't happen to remember exactly what our child welfare mandates are here as a county, I will briefly go over what it is that each county is responsible for. I will remind you what it was that we said in 2019, 2020 when we came and spoke with you. Then we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing today and a bit about the uh, near future and what we'll be doing next. So our county system, each county system in Wisconsin is responsible to ensure that we have the ability to accept phone calls um, or communication of any kind if someone is concerned about potential safety risk, potential neglect, each county needs a system to accept those, to assess those, open those for ongoing monitoring and services if needed, and hopefully not often, but sometimes when uh, families need to be um, split apart and children taken away, hopefully to be placed with other relatives, but sometimes that isn't an option, counties also need to be able to do that as well. As you can see from up on the display, this is a large system. This is a large responsibility. We have four supervisors, approximately 24 social workers and support staff. There's about seven and a half million dollars of overall funding inside this system, about four and a half million of which is levy. So this is something that um, is very near and dear to counties, um, very expensive, very important work as it relates to the safety of children in our communities. We came in 2019 talking to the board about the need for a resolution, the need for some conversation with local legislators and the Department of Health Services and the Department of Children and Families. Uh, it wasn't good enough in Wisconsin. We had a crisis situation. Certain counties were closing departments because of expenses. Some counties had 100% staff turnover. Children in some communities were being sent to Tennessee, Arkansas, other states because there was nowhere left in our own state to care for these children. That's what the words crisis meant there, and that was something felt across the state. 80% of cases across the state uh, in the child protective system were in, had some sort of complication from substance use. Here in Sheboygan County, when we looked at children that were removed over the course of uh, 2010 to 2018, 276 children were removed because of caretaker drug abuse. Um, that's a 110% increase over about a six-year period of time. Unacceptable workloads across the state. Best practice was talking about maybe eight families per worker, maybe 15 children. And outside of Milwaukee back in 2019, it was about 15 families per worker, about 30 children per worker. Um, so it's hard to do good work uh, when you're working with twice the uh, suggested number of cases. And county match, uh, as you can see from this last graphic, counties were required by statutes to be putting $6.8 million into the child welfare system. Counties were overmatching that by 1,600% to the tune of more like $117.9 million. Uh, so a crisis funding-wise, a crisis in terms of outcomes and children being removed. Another example of the children being removed, if I can get it to go here. This was a slide back in 2019. We shared this over the course of six years or so. The number of kids in out-of-home care across the state increased by 40%, 39%. In Sheboygan, that same time frame, it increased 200%. Um, so a crisis in the state was a double crisis here in Sheboygan. And not only did more children go in out-of-home care, but they stayed in out-of-home care for 131% longer um, over that same time frame. So that's what we said in 2019. A lot of data, a lot of scary numbers. 2020, back in the leadership forum, we talked with you again. That we had plans, but we wanted to remind you there are still 80% of the cases coming into our system complicated by substance use. There are still an increasing number of children in our community. Um, 
up to 96 in 2019 versus 21 in 2011, increasing numbers of kids because of substance use, caretaker drug abuse. These issues aren't going away. The Sheboygan workload, um, that uh, best practice again was roughly 1 to 15 for children. We were in the 1 to 17 to 20. Um, not quite in the 1 to 30, but again, hard to focus and do best practice when you have large loads like that. I'd mentioned in 2019 how our cases of numbers of out-of-home care had gone up 200%. If you added about another year, year and a half to that data, they actually went up 247% in Sheboygan. And then our levy over the course of 2010 to 2018 went up almost 2 million. A couple years later, almost another 2 million. So the crisis has continued, but um, really one thing that, uh, I don't know, I call a tipping point on this scale, as we were gathering our ideas on what we needed to do to change, we finally got some data from the regional office. It felt like it was worse in Sheboygan, and we got some data, uh, which you can see here is a bunch of different colored lines. Those are communities of similar size. We should expect to be somewhere in the middle of those. We are the number up on top. We had approximately 100 children more in out-of-home care on a given day than many of our equivalent counties. And what I told the board um, during the leadership forum was some of that was bad luck in our community from substance use and things like that, but that's everywhere. Some of that is that we just weren't as innovative as we needed to be. Somewhere along the line, our practice had shifted and we needed to tighten our belts and do a better job. That's what we've been working on for the past year and a half. It helps that the state did increase um, recognized that there was a challenge related to the funding um, and in the last biennial budget there was a substantial increase that counties received. That was helpful but again that wasn't the full answer. What really did it, I'm just going to pop all these up there. Um, this slide here shows that going back to about early 2020 when we were recognizing that things needed to change here, we started a lot of different action. We changed the methods and mechanisms in which we staffed cases from the next morning after something might have happened, through how we reviewed them on an ongoing basis, how often we reviewed them, the tools that we used. We maximized the referrals to the other kinds of great services that we have. Our Children with Long-Term Support Program, which is well-funded by the state. Our Comprehensive Community Services Program for kids with mental health issues. That's well-funded by the state. We have been growing those as systems that need to be serving children who are at risk. We changed the way we worked in the court systems with uh, our legal services. We began a new partnership with Corporation Council um, back at the beginning of 2020 that has been very successful. Um, some great work. The DA's office was trying very hard, but had a lot of turnover and wasn't able to devote the amount of staff time that we're able to get now. Um, that process was going so well that we uh, received permission to use a little bit of our reserve to enhance that. A uh, little chart there that you can't see, for every 25 kids or so that we can get to permanency, um, it's good for them and it saves the county about $250,000 a year. So we have a temporary increase for our legal services to try to get more of those through the legal system, more permanency for those children and families. And then the biggest box on the end is because that's where most of our work's coming from. We started a process improvement with the state facilitation. We had, we've had 18 different teams so far working on things from tools to comparing our practice to other counties, to the legal services, to how we communicate with the judges, to who we're communicating with in the schools and how we're um, doing the various collaborations, to team morale, anything that might affect how effective our system is. That's been going for about, um, going strong for almost a year now and a lot of staff buy-in. So now what I want to do is really talk about the stuff that I think is pretty exciting. This first graph that you see here, this is trying to represent that every year we get roughly 100 or so uh, contacts from the community that they're worried that somebody might be at risk, there might be a safety concern, possible neglect, anywhere from 1,100 to 1,300 a year. It dipped a little bit in the pandemic situation because there weren't as many kids in school for as long, which is a place where some of those uh, situations get recognized. Um, but still, our business stayed fairly stable in terms of the number of referrals. This next graph is showing 
As a county, when we have more kids out of home than other counties, what it's showing is that we have dis different risk tolerance. We are opening more cases. We are being probably too conservative, um, which is hard to say because you're talking about children's safety. But other communities our, our size are not opening as many cases. They're finding a way to support the families in the home or not open them to services um, and refer them to other things instead. So as our business stayed about the same, this same, or this second graph is showing that the number of cases we screened to open to our services has started to decrease. As we staff things different, as we use different tools, fewer families are being opened, more families we are finding alternatives to keep safe other than opening them to our system. The number of times when we go to the legal system to say we have a child in need of protective services, mm -hmm. We think most likely we will need to remove that child and place them somewhere. That has gone down from a roughly 165 cases in 2019 to projected 88 cases this year. Again, we're finding different ways other than removing children to help keep them safe. And my favorite slide, because this really shows, this goes back to 2017. You look at the beginning of 2019 with that 367, there was a day we had 367 children in out-of-home care. That was probably a day when we were using that word crisis a lot. Uh, at the end of the first quarter, when we happened to look on March 31st or April 1st, our system had 193 children in out-of-home care. Um, we are keeping kids safe. We are finding a way to do that differently, um, to offer more services to families in their homes, remove less kids from homes, which is better for them. We need to keep them safe, but there is effects when you remove kids from homes. Even if you're keeping them safe, you're causing challenges in other areas. So some great results. We're not done. I think that number is still higher than some comparative counties, but it is much closer than it was a year or two ago. As we look at next steps, we hope to propose some ideas. The American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 uh, consciously recognizes that the child welfare system is probably being affected by the pandemic as more and more families have been struggling, um, anxiety, mental health, as things have been challenging, that probably will show up. And so funding can be used to strengthen community alternatives. So I'm sure we'll be looking closely at that. Governor Evers' budget has a lot of uh, enhancements to the community system in there. I'm not sure how many of those will make it through the Joint Finance Committee process, but we're hopeful that um, possibly some additional funding or some new infrastructure supports for counties to build more community services comes out. We have to take a very close look at our caseloads. As we talk to the counties that are doing a little bit better than us, um, they're working with one to 12, one to 15 children. We're working with one to 17, one to 20. Um, we want to believe that we're better than other counties, but we may need to take a look at some point in terms of our caseload sizes to get to that next step. And then federally, there's a whole movement federally for states to do more of what we're doing right now. The federal government wants to see less kids in out-of-home care, more kids being served in the community. That would have kind of scared me with our numbers two years ago, and I don't think we're ready yet, but we're well on the track um, to maximizing those community alternatives. Uh, really proud tonight to be sharing some of those early indicators that our system really has turned the corner um, and is looking uh, in a way that makes us much more proud and innovative than we would have said a couple years ago. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Next to our public addresses. All right. <clears throat> First is Philip Jones. Philip here. Philip didn't make it. Um, Suzanne Spelt is next. Suzanne here. State your name, address, and you'll have five minutes. Um, hi, my name is Suzanne Speltz, and I live at 3917 um, Mendocino Lane. Anyways, um, before I start, I just wanted to say that the, I know that there are some persons here who truly have the, best, the citizens' best interest in mind, and they, um, you protect our constitutional rights. Um, that being said, I have concerns in regards to 
the transparency of our county government um, ever since this Ordinance 3 came down. And that was an issue that appeared to me to be announced um, at the very latest possible moment in hopes of getting it through before the public could find out about it. That's how I took it. Of course, we all knew it was defeated due to many people rising up and speaking out. I suppose that was what the county, some people in the county were trying to avoid. Um, and after all that, I discovered via open records requests that certain individuals were planning for more enforcements similar to what Ordinance 3 would have done. I took this as more secret planning. And then just recently on May 4th, a few citizens were on the Health and Human Services Committee meeting and we were made rather inadvertently, it appeared to me anyway, so this pandemic administrative panel that had been going on for a year. Um, and I asked this question, was this another effort that was meant to stay hidden from the citizens? Um, once I did receive the minutes, one of the items was community pop-up clinics with possibly the schools. Then on Monday, May 10th, the Sheboygan Area School District told students and <clears throat> families that there would be pop-up clinics at the schools starting on Wednesday, May 12th. I do not know this for sure, but I wonder how much influence um, our public health and county government had in these clinics being starting up. Um, being that these Vs are highly questionable, which much evidence that they are dangerous medical experiments, you would think that the public should have been made aware of these pop-up clinics sooner, especially since it involves minors. Assuming that the county had influence in this situation, was it hidden purposely because people knew that they would be pushed back from the public? Who knows? I don't really know for sure, but I would imagine somebody does. I have never paid much attention to local government until last year where I saw our rights and freedoms being chipped away at under the guise of health and safety. I believe our governments were originally set up to work for the citizens. Now I'm not sure really who government is working for, Anyways, as long as I have breath left in me, I will continue to speak up for my rights and the rights of others. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Judy Poole. Um, I'm Judy Poole, and I live at 18 Ashwood Drive in Sheboygan. The day after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, a school teacher named Jane Elliott conducted an experiment with her third grade classroom. She divided the students between blue eyes and brown eyes. She proceeded to tell them that children with blue eyes are better and smarter than children with brown eyes. At recess, she told the blue-eyed children they could play on the playground equipment while the children with brown eyes could not. The blue-eyed children could go to lunch first. She instructed the blue-eyed students to put brown collars around the necks of the brown-eyed children. The consequences of the minimal group experiment became very evident quickly. With the superiority of the blue-eyed children um, that they began to feel, and with the support of the authority figure, the teacher, the blue-eyed children became more aggressive and mean to the brown-eyed ones. They started calling them brown eyes as an insult. They refused to play with them and harass them constantly. They even started physical fights with the so-called inferior group. The second day, Elliot reversed the groups. She told them arbitrary reasons why now brown-eyed children were better and smarter. Blue collars were now placed on the blue-eyed children. The results were the same. What this experiment proved was that in an authoritarian environment, the group closest to the authority figure, in this case the teacher, feels superior and justified. It's the teacher's role to be the mediators between children with superficial differences, not instigators or punishers. This is wrong to try pit children, parents, and teachers against each other. As I told the Sheboygan School District Board last night, my concern is the coercive methods being used to divide citizens in this county. Base friendly people versus those who want to wear masks. Those who believe in natural herd immunity versus vaccine advocates. 
The board comp uh, compromised somewhat, but were reluctant to make masks optional immediately. Instead, they stated the schools will be mask optional after this term starting June 9th. Even ultra-liberal Mayor Tom Barrett proclaimed masks optional today, giving until June 1st for people and businesses to make changes. The obvious collaboration between government and private businesses in this county to push an agenda has been astounding. The bullying and demeaning coming from some county board members has been very disturbing. Jane Elliott's experiment is being conducted today by people in authority over regular citizens who just want to live their lives as free Americans. I believe that some of the board members here know that our Republican Constitution protect first the right of the individual above any and all local policies. Unfortunately, other members may have forgotten this and need to be reminded. Still others are aware of this fact, yet their own personal biases and ambitions are overriding the rights of the people to choose how they live. Please consider which category you are in. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. That is all we have for public addresses. All right, next is letters, communications, and announcements. Okay, we have a few. I have a resolution, two, from Washington and Wapaka County Boards of Supervisors supporting legislation providing an increase in criminal and ordinance violation surcharges. We'll refer that to the law committee. I have resolutions from Washington and Wapaka County uh, Boards of Supervisors supporting legislation that removes requirements for duplicate copies of transcripts for application of search warrants. We'll refer that to the law committee. And two from Wood County. The first, opposing changes to the wildlife damage and claims program. Okay, that will refer to the Planning Resources Agriculture and Extension Committee. And the last one from Wood, uh, resolution requesting Wisconsin to strengthen its hate crime statute 939.645. And that we will refer to the law committee. That is all we have. Next is the county administrator's report. Good evening. Isn't it nice to look on our faces? Uh, it's just it's wonderful to be here. I want to thank um, Chris Lewinsky and, and Elaine. They're both in the control room back there, but Chris Lewinsky in particular, all of this IT and technology that's before us now, not, not only benefiting the county board, benefiting the public so more people can participate in these meetings, whether they're in person or participating virtually, and of course our court system. The court system really took a hit the last year and slowed things down, have a lot of catching up to do, and this is benefiting the courts as well. So uh, my compliments and appreciation to our IT staff and Chris Lewinsky and his leadership. I also wanted to thank Matt Stripmotter for his excellent and uplifting presentation about child welfare. Uh, the child welfare crisis is real, and Matt's leadership, his thoughtful leadership, and the team he's working with has made such a difference. So thank you to the county board for your support the Health and Human Services Committee. And also I want to give a shout out to Crystal Fever, our Corporation Council. Uh, the collaboration between Corp Council and Health and Human Services I think has been as strong as ever and it's really making an impact. So thank you both. I have a few areas I'm going to touch on tonight. Do you have the clicker? Do you need this, Cheryl? You're good. First, uh, next slide, please. I want to look at some comparative statistics. 14 months we've been at this. 14 long, challenging months. And no one's had a road map to follow. And uh, it's, it's taken a toll on our community, and our country, and, and the world. And when we were really starting to pour into this, as you know, back in March of 2020, uh, look at the active cases at that time. The U.S. active case count was 4,565. Sadly, 85 people had passed from COVID. The Wisconsin active case count was 72. No one had passed away. And of course, in little old Sheboygan County, we only had four active cases and no deaths. So in March, when we were all trying to get our arms around this, and what does this mean, and how do we prepare, how do we go through our emergency planning and work in collaboration with others to safeguard our coworkers and community, 
We were hungry for information, and again, no one had a roadmap. We had individuals who, who came forward and suggested we didn't need to do much, or that it was a hoax, or it wasn't more, more serious than the flu. And I appreciated the uh, public speaker's comments about treating everybody with respect. I remember early on last summer when people started wearing masks, some of them were shamed for doing so. Yet we continue to hear how wearing masks is so important to protect ourselves and others. And it's also really knocked down the flu season, which has been a, one of the positives in this ongoing pandemic. But look at where we are a year later. The US confirmed case count over 32 million people contracted COVID. The active case count is just under 6 million. 586,000 people have died directly as a result of COVID or it's been a, a contributing factor. I think of those families across the country and truly it saddens me and I think more and more of us in this community now know people have been impacted and the difference it can make. If you don't think it's serious, ask one of those families that lost a loved one. The Wisconsin confirmed case count is now about 606,000. The active case count is 6,846. And of course, we think it's much higher than that. This is the reported active case count. And then sadly, there's been nearly 7,000 deaths in the state of Wisconsin to date. In Sheboygan County, 13,769 people have con had confirmed COVID. The active case count today dropped again to 79. I think it went below 100 yesterday, and it was difficult not to get up and cheer. It's just so good to see these recent trends go down. It's, it's, it's just good for everyone and uh, really pleased. In fact, we haven't been below 80 since last August of 2020. And at one point, you may recall, we had a high activity case count. It peaked at 2,600 people in November. We've come a long way. Sadly, 143 people have passed away from COVID or COVID-related impact. And uh, of course, uh, we feel for those families and those people impacted in this community. CDC came out with some wonderful news last week. And that's why I think most of us in the room aren't wearing a mask tonight. If you're fully vaccinated, you are no longer strongly urged, required to wear a mask. And we just communicated that information with all of our employees today. We have about 850 employees, and I doubt there's many people in this community that aren't aware of this CDC guidance. And uh, I know that Chairman Koch and I and a few others attended a, a, a function just that evening, a Chamber County function. And we would have been in there with our masks on without question. And we walked in, and you could just feel the elation in the room and how much people enjoyed seeing one another and interacting and so we've come a long way. Of course, that recommendation is driven on science and how far we have come to starting to combat COVID and defeat this pandemic. Uh, really encouraged by it. And again, it's just good to be here tonight, meeting in person again safely and, and seeing one another's faces. All of that information to our employees was obviously shared with the county board this afternoon as well, and I presume many of you saw that. So thank you for your support. Next slide, please. That evening uh, at the chamber, uh, we got to celebrate some success. And you know, I don't think we often take enough time to cel celebrate success nor really reflect on where we've been and what we've where we could improve, what we could do better going forward. But uh, the community has been coming together of late to recognize outstanding professionals and people who have gone above and beyond to do good work. And as you can see, our Starling Grossman, our public health officer, who has dealt with some of the most heavy lifting you can imagine over the last year, year and a half, was recognized by United Way of being the Outstanding Essential Worker of the Year. I mean, wonderful attribute to her. Next slide, please. It didn't stop there. Our Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce also had an award tonight. That's the function we were at last week. And STAR, once again, was identified 
as an outstanding leader in this community who has gone above and beyond. She was recognized as the top young professional of the year, Star Grossman. Our Sheboygan County Public Health Officer. You know, the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation has been very supportive of, from day one of our public health guidelines and actions. They, they know we're not perfect, but they know we care and we're trying to protect this community and keep businesses open, and they've been very supportive. We had folks like David Kohler and Lou Gentine and um, Johnsonville and many other companies do a public service announcement encouraging people to wear masks, social distance, follow CDC guidance, get vaccinated when you can, when it's your turn. And I, I can't thank our pillars of this community and our community as a whole for their support and collaboration. And again, it's just nice to see some of that, those tributes going to one of our own county employees in public health. Next slide, please. It doesn't end there. Representative Lynn Grothman, Congressman Grothman, wrote a letter to Starr, and I'm going to read it. I would like to commend Ms. Starlene Grossman for being named the top young professional of the year by the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. This award recognizes a young professional who has made all around significant contributions to civic, charitable, entertainment, or quality of life within Sheboygan County. Ms. Starlene Grossman has distinguished herself as a Sheboygan County Division of Public Health as the Supervisor of Public Health and Community Engagement. Starlene has gone above and beyond to ensure the safety of the citizens of Sheboygan County during the COVID-19 pandemic. Staying up to date with the most critical information and working tirelessly to keep the public informed and healthy, she deserves this award. Once again, I would like to commend Starr for receiving the Top Young Professional of the Year Award. I wish Ms. Starlene Grossman all the best as she continues to serve others in her community. These are just three examples. I can't think of someone who deserves it more, but I'll tell you what, I'm so proud of her and proud of our organization, and I hope we all recognize we should all be celebrating this recognition. We don't make any decisions here in a vacuum. There isn't one individual that makes all the calls here. We always collaborate and work together before we make decisions. And we certainly were doing this with public health. I mean, public health has a lot of statutory responsibility. Start as a public health officer. But not once was she making decisions without working with her team, working with Matt Stripmotter working with Corporation Council, working with the county board or committee, the county administrator, all of us work together to make the best decisions we could. There's this administrative pandemic committee that came up during public comment. I just want to touch on that. We have a county board and nine standing committees making thoughtful, deliberate decisions, all these policymakers, all these elected officials. But I can tell you there are literally not dozens, hundreds of advisory committees and internal committees and staff committees and working with others to get input, problem solve, work in collaboration. That's what we do. And that's what this administrative pandemic committee has been doing for the last year. It was established by county policy. If something hits the fan, and it did, this group convened. Who's on, the, who's on this group? Residents of our hospitals, law enforcement, emergency responders, school administrators, nurses. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's, it's a group of public and private sector individuals doing emergency planning and working in collaboration to serve this community. Of course, if any policy, final policy decisions need to be made, such as the ordinance that was considered in August and ultimately not supported, but that, in part, came out of that administrative panel group because doctors and hospital presidents wanted to make sure that we worked together and were doing emergency planning, being transparent and sharing what we might do if things get worse. Fortunately, we never had to take some of the actions that were being considered. But this group really deserves a lot of credit 
for their service to this community. And it's an ongoing service. It hasn't stopped. So take pride in these awards that Starlene Grossman received. The next time you see her or send her a note, but it reflects on Sheboygan County government and all of you as county board supervisors and what you've done to support our public health team, provide the resources we need, the decisions we've made together in collaboration. Next slide, please. So moving forward, you heard Matt talk about the American Rescue Plan a little bit. That is the hot topic, a hot and a, certainly a more positive topic than the ongoing discussion of COVID. We'd like to think COVID is starting to see the end our, of the road. And let's focus on making some wonderful investments in our community. Let's continue to help make some good things happen. So the state of Wisconsin, as you heard, at one point it was about $3 billion that they were going to receive, about $3.2 billion. The numbers all got ruled out last week, and adjustments were made. I don't know all the formula information behind that, but the state of Wisconsin is going to receive about $2.5 billion. Sheboygan County will receive $22 million. That actually went up about $900,000. The city of Sheboygan is going to receive $22 million. There's dropped a little bit. But all in all, in my career, I've never experienced a situation where we're getting direct resources from the federal government to help make wise investments and improve our community. Uh, maybe the non-motorized transportation program. That was a $25 million grant we had years ago to improve our bike trails. But this, this is, as far as I'm concerned, a really unique situation. And as I shared with the Finance Committee last week, I'm fired up about it. I mean, we're always striving here just to hold our own and keep our heads above water and maintain the programs and services we provide. You, as elected officials, are truly going to be able to make some decisions on how these funds are used to better our community. And believe me, ideas are starting to float our direction. But we have until December of 2024 to expend these funds. So often you receive news like this and you gotta spend it the same year, right? We've got three, three and a half years to make decisions here. So we can be thoughtful, we can be deliberative, we can work with other communities to leverage resources. We're already having discussions with the city of Sheboygan. We can work with the private sector to leverage resources. Why? Because that's what we do. It's exciting. A little flavor for it. Next slide, please. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go to the US Department of Treasury website. They've got more information there than you probably care to read. I think the entire bill was over 150 pages. But this, this high-end fact sheet boils it down to two pages. I think I sent this to the board a week week or so ago and encourage you, if you have time, this would probably be a good thing to take a look at. This shares the eligibility for how these funds can be used because, of course, increasingly more people are encouraged by this one. And, well, what can we use the funds for? What, what's possible? So if you get a chance, take a look at it. But very quickly, these funds may be used to support public health response. You heard Matt talk about important programs that they have in health and human services and what we might be able to do to do more good work there support um, behavioral health care, things of that nature. Address negative economic impacts. That's pretty broad when you hear that. There certainly were some negative economic impacts the past year. But we're going to be able to help speed the recovery of impacted industries, promote the area, promote businesses, promote tourism, promote people to move and live and work in Sheboygan County. In fact, we're already having discussions with Discover Wisconsin and how we can have a broader state and regional approach to marketing our area and helping recruit and retain citizens, workers. We continue to have three, 4,000 job openings in Sheboygan County. For the last decade, we've been talking about two and a half to 4,000 job openings in Sheboygan County. One of the key barriers we have to that right now is housing. Where are you going to put all these people if they do come? So we are going to have some opportunities to address negative economic impacts and marketing our area, helping businesses, recruit and retain staff, working on things like housing are all possibilities. We can replace public sector revenue loss. This is good for local property taxpayers. Everyone in this room is paying property taxes. When you have something like COVID hit the fan, you don't have that plan for necessarily. You don't have a huge budget for that, right? We had most of that recovered already. Think of Rocky Null. Our census went down from about 130 to 99. The lower our census is at Rocky Knoll, the less revenue we have coming in to support the overall operation of that facility. 
that could require more of a property tax subsidy. With this funding, we're able to mitigate the loss of some of those dollars rather than put it on the shoulders of local property taxpayers. Water and sewer infrastructure. The city is going to be looking at that real quick, carefully, as will other municipalities. But where might we need some water or sewer infrastructure from a county point of view? Rocky Knoll has a wastewater treatment facility that Elkhart Lake and surrounding areas uh, rely upon. We may want to take a look at that and see whether or not we need to make further investments to enhance it while we have this opportunity. The other thought that has come to mind is our airport. The Sheboygan County Memorial Airport is ripe to explode with economic development. We've had folks who'd like to create a headquarters there, build there. It will absolutely further enhance our community. It's a jewel. If you haven't checked out the US Customs Facility and Terminal, get out there. It's beautiful. But you know what we don't have out there? We don't have sewer. We rely on wells. And that's a little tough to build a headquarters or a new business if you don't have that infrastructure. We may, you may want to consider that going forward. Broadband infrastructure. No doubt you're all hearing a lot about broadband infrastructure. I'm, I'm excited about this too. But you're a student in school, attending. Lakeland, a business who wants to operate more effectively, we all know in this room that there are areas in this community that are underserved or it's pitifully slow. And if there's one area of agreement there appear at the state and federal level, it appears to be investing more in broadband. So we could use some of these funds for that, but there are also other opportunities through the state resources that we may be able to tap into that and not necessarily use ours. Bottom line is we're already talking to folks. There's a company in the village of Randy, Random Lake that does this. I want to recognize Supervisor Bill Gehring who brought it to my attention and helped facilitate a meeting. Vern Koch, Chairman Koch joined us. We're already talking to a local company that can do broadband infrastructure to hear their ideas. And they contacted us through Supervisor Gehring and the SEDC. So we're hearing, we're learning. Uh, Thursday this week we're going to be having a heads of government meeting and we're going to give a discussion of broadband just to raise everyone's understanding of what it is and how it can be helpful, and why it's so important for economic development. So that's in play. And then finally, and I said it earlier, housing. Uh, I'm so pleased the city of Sheboygan Mayor Brian Sorensen has really made an issue of wanting to further enhance housing. I mean, it's, let's say, for example, there's three, 4,000 job openings right now, right? And we put together a program of some kind. We're able to recruit thousand people to move to Sheboygan County to start working at Sargento and Johnsonville and other places. Places that want to expand if they had the workers. Where are they going to live? We've got some barriers to work together as a community to overcome. So ultimately through our annual budget process, our deliberate, thoughtful budget process, committees, department heads, anyone in the public can weigh in and offer suggestions. Matt Stripmatter has already reached out to his staff a few weeks ago and encouraged them to reach out to nonprofits on ideas they may have. We are open to ideas. And if you get co contacted from a nonprofit or anybody who has an idea, particularly if they're your constituent, hear them out. See what they think. Forward it on to the respective department that may work in that area. If it's a behavioral health or mental health service, be a good idea to contact Matt Strip, Matt Motter, or a member of his team so it can be vetted a little bit more. But ultimately, that's going to go through the committees, the finance, exec, full county board, and be, again, thoughtfully considered. Next slide, please. We'll conclude on a lighter note. We have, as you know, for a number of years, well, as long as I can remember, we provide 5, 10, 15, 20-year pins to county board supervisors and employees. As you may recall, we didn't do that last year. It's not quite as meaningful to do it if you can't be in person and recognize the person. So we have three five-year pins, pins to give to three county board supervisors this evening. If Vern and Robert could please join me. Now the first county board supervisor would not be in attendance this evening, but he's with us virtually. So Brian Hillblink, it's nice to see your face up there and both uh, virtually and, and we've got your photo from the, the county board file. 
And let me just share a few, uh, a little bit of background about Brian and some of the things he's been involved in. Brian was appointed to the county board in May of 2015, filling the vacated seat of Devin Lemieux, who is now serving in the state senate. Brian has served on the property committee since he joined the county board and also served on the human resources committee. During his tenure on the county board property committee, Brian supported a number of construction projects, including the Health and Human Services Front Lobby Edition. Boy, if you haven't seen that, check that out. It's beautiful. The Engineering Lab Edition at UW Sheboygan. Combined Emergency Dispatch Remodeling in the Sheriff's Department, the Taylor Park Shelter Replacement, the Transportation Complex, and more recently, the Courthouse Secured Entrance and our new U.S. Customs Facility and Terminal. You start hearing these things and you, start, and you recall just how many projects and investments we've made as an organization and you've made as a county board. Brian's background and experience is highly valued and appreciated, and he and his fellow county board supervisors certainly, you certainly have made some significant investments. So please join Chairman Koch, Vice Chairman Zigabauer, and me in recognizing Supervisor Brian Hilbling for five years of dedicated service. We will we will take his pen to his home or whatever he prefers, but let's put our hands together for Brian. <laughs> Would County Board Supervisor Henry Nelson please join me up here? Henry was elected to the County Board in April of 2006. How's that work? Well, <laughs> he went... He went and spent some time with the City Common Council, but he was subsequently appointed to fill a vacancy on the County Board in 2015. So this is his five-year pin this evening as well, though it could be seven plus. We don't have seven plus pins. It's five, ten. It's just the way it works, right? Henry is currently serving on the Planning, Resources, Agriculture, and Extension Committee and is chair of the Property Committee. During Henry's tenure, he supported and oversaw the same projects I just touched on that Brian was involved with, so I'm not going to repeat that, including relocation of the Veteran Service Office to the Aging and Disability Resource Center and numerous facility enhancements throughout this organization to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. We talk a lot about public health, but our property committee and building services staff really stepped up to help keep our employees and people utilize our facilities safe as well. So we thank you for that, Henry. Henry is also a champion of natural resources protection and enhancement and supported the enhancements we have made at the Amsterdam Dunes, Sheboygan County Marsh, and the new Sheboygan County Marsh Envi Environmental Center that is currently under construction. Henry also served on the Health and Human Services Committee from 2015 to 18, and suffice it to say, Henry is a very thoughtful, engaged, and valuable member of our team who, like all of us in this room, strives for continuous improvement and the wise use of taxpayer resources. Please join Chairman Koch, Vice Chairman Ziegelbauer, and I in recognizing Henry for five dedicated years. <laughs> and finally, who is that? What county board supervisor could be in that photo? He certainly is a good looking son of a gun. Next slide, please. Could Keith, could Keith Obler please join us up here? I can't believe it's been 20 years. 20 years. Keith was elected to the county board in 2000, the year after I started with the county. He's currently serving as chairperson of the Planning, Resources, Agriculture, and Extension Committee, a committee in which he served from 20, 2008 to 2010, and then again from 2012 to present. In the past, before some of the liaison committees were combined, he served on the Resources Committee, the Agriculture, and Land Conservation Committee. Keith is also a member, currently, of the Executive and Finance Committees. In addition, Keith previously served on the Human Resources Committee from 2012 to 2020 and on the Property Committee. I think Keith is a great example of when you move around and serve on different committees, you get such a, a breadth of experience and knowledge of county government. And of course, as we all know, particularly those of you who have been around longer, every committee you go to, you're learning new things. We're always learning new things, and he's done a wonderful job doing so. I have always appreciated 
Keith's thoughtful, down-to-earth approach and fair-mindedness. He has a track record of being an engaged problem solver, improving the environment, and strengthening our organization. After 20 years, the list is far too long in what Keith has all been a part of and contributed toward. But let me just name it. Keith played a key role in consolidating the Land and Water Conservation Department with planning, improving our county's fiscal track record, helped lead the charge to see the vision of the Sheboygan County Marsh Tower become a reality. Keith also supported the development of the County Stewardship Fund, the Buffer Strip Program, in order to help protect and enhance our water quality. He supported the acquisition of the property around Gerber Lake, improving the Sheboygan County Marsh Campground, cleaning up and restoring the Sheboygan River and Harbor, what I think is a top 10 accomplishment of this county board, and purchasing the Amsterdam Dunes Preservation Area and Wetland Mitigation Bank, another thing that I think is a top 10 accomplishment. And certainly Roger Destruti deserves a lot of credit for that. Keith has also been instrumental in improving upon our employee policies and helping assure we are doing right by our coworkers. During Keith's time with the property committee, he helped oversee the sale of the Comprehensive Healthcare Center, build a significant, beautiful addition to Rocky Knoll, complete the UW Sheboygan Science Building, the Technology Center, and with all that said, Keith has contributed to Sheboygan County having on average only a 1.2% property tax levy increase annually for over a decade. All the projects that I mentioned, all the investments you've made, all the improvements that this organization has done, and on average, property taxes have gone up only 1.2% over the last decade. He's been a big part of that. You all have been a part of that. These are accomplishments our county board and our community can take pride in. So in brief, Keith is a great guy with a big heart and a strong, wonderful voice. Please join Vern, Robert, and I in congratulating Keith for 20 years of dedicated service. Consideration of committee reports, executive committee, resolution number one. Regarding disallowance of roll claim against Sheboygan County, recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Gehring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for adoption of resolution number one. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Supervisor Testrodi. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Testrodi. Under discussion? Seeing no discussion, please vote. Supervisor Schobert, yay or nay? Yay. Supervisor Hilbelink, yay or nay? Yay. Supervisor Bosman, yay or nay? Yay. Thank you. Approved unanimously. Resolution number three, regarding adoption of the Sheboygan County Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation and Open Space Plan 2021 <laughs> recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to adopt resolution three. Thank you, Supervisor Clark. Supervisor Obler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll support the resolution adoption. Thank you, Supervisor Obler. Under discussion. Seeing no discussion, please vote. Supervisor Schobert, yay or nay? Yay. Supervisor Hillblink? Yay. Supervisor Bosman? Yay.
Yes. That's approved unanimously. Okay, resolution number five regarding approving First Amendment to Sheboygan County Airport ground lease with Sheboygan County Aviation Corp. Recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Gehring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for adoption of resolution number five. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Supervisor Destrodi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll second motion. Thank you, Supervisor Destrodi. Under discussion. Seeing no discussion, please vote. Supervisor Schobert, yay or nay? Yay. Supervisor Hobelink? Yay. Supervisor Bosman? Yay. Aye. Motion is approved unanimously. Consideration of committee reports, finance committee, resolution number two. Regarding authorizing application to Department of Natural Resources for a grant to control agricultural or urban storm runoff pollution sources, recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for passage of resolution number two. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Montemayor. I second that. Thank you, Supervisor Montemayor. Under discussion. Seeing none, please vote. Supervisor Schobert, yay or name? Yay. Supervisor Hilbelink? Yay. Supervisor Bosman? Yay. And I. That's approved unanimously. Consideration of committee reports, planning resources, agriculture and extension committee, resolution number four. Regarding approving easement for location and replacement of drain tile, town of Sheboygan, Sheboygan County Memorial Airport, recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Obler. I'll make a motion, Mr. Chair, to approve resolution number four. Thank you, Supervisor Obler. S Supervisor Brower. I will second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Brower. And under discussion. Seeing no discussion, please vote. Supervisor Schobert, yay your name? Yay. Supervisor Hubblink? Yay. Supervisor Bosman? Yay. And I. That also is approved unanimously. All right, with that I turn the gavel over to Supervisor Ziegelbauer. Seeing that there are no resolutions that are urgent to be produced, I will ask uh, Supervisor Desprudia to come to the next order of business. Is there a second? Thank you, Supervisor Immel. Vice Chair, I will. Thank you, Supervisor Immel. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Supervisor Schobert, yay or nay? Yay. Supervisor Hilbelink. Yay. Supervisor Bosman. Yay, yay. And Super Supervisor Clark. Gruber, Abler. Aye. Supervisor Damp, Supervisor Immel, Supervisor OJ. Supervisor Damp. Thank you. We are adjourned.